Hey everyone, welcome to Ask Shane Anything, and that means the weekend is here. It's Friday, it's almost Saturday, it's almost Sunday. Your gaming weekend has almost arrived, and I'm here to usher you right on into it. Hope you guys have had a great week. Hope you guys have an awesome weekend planned. As you know, this is a show where you can ask me pretty much anything, and I'll answer it. Um, this show is possible because some of y'all are pledging at $7 or more per month specifically so you can get this show. I appreciate it very much. We let everybody watch the archive, and we do let everyone ask questions, but we do place a priority on those of you who are pledging at that $7 tier. We got a bunch of great questions again this week. You guys are killing it. Let's get right to them. All right, we're kicking things off with Kevin, who has a question in every episode of Ask Shane Anything. Who do you think is the most important and iconic video game character that has been introduced in the last 10 to 15 years? Okay, so I'm going to take this question as two parts. I'm going to give you answers for both. I'm going to give you an answer for iconic, and I'm going to give you an answer for the most important. And I will start, well, actually the first pick kind of checks both of those boxes, and that character is Geralt from The Witcher. Now, 15 years, that might be pushing it a little bit. I think the first Witcher is maybe a little bit older than that, and technically he goes all the way back to the books. And the books are much older than 15 years. But to me, he's really come into his own in the last 15 years. Really, he kind of hit his stride with The Witcher 3. Um, so that, to me, is kind of the the point where he became bigger than just this guy who was the star of this action RPG franchise that you should be playing, but you probably weren't. And let's be honest, that was kind of the story with the first two Witcher games. So Geralt, I think... The reason he didn't hit with the first two games is because he seems very nondescript. He seems like this blank slate of a person. He's very gruff. Um, he He's not overly wordy. Exposition is certainly not his strong suit. But what I like about him is he's very introspective. He is this monster slayer, this sword for hire guy. But he's also a deep thinker. And that is what has attracted me to his games as well, not just him as a character. And I think that's also why his show, or The Witcher show, on Netflix has become a big hit. Now we're starting to see some rumblings that this season that's going on right now has fallen big time as far as viewers are concerned. But still, he's already buoyed two seasons of a show on Netflix that transcended whether people had ever heard of The Witcher or liked video games or not. So he's an anomaly. He's not this character that you see and you're like, oh, he's the guy with the crazy hat or he's the guy with the crazy gun, or he's the guy who has these this very specific magical ability. Those are generally the things that really set off video game characters, but not him. He's kind of won the day by being this steady hand, this consistent character through three games and now through the TV series. So I think Geralt checks both of those boxes. He is iconic and he's important. Um, now let's talk about importance. To me, another really important video game character that's emerged over the last decade plus is Chloe from Life is Strange. Now, by now, most of you guys have played Life is Strange. It's been given away at various, you know, I think PlayStation Plus gave it away. I think Xbox Live gave it away. Most of you guys have experienced Chloe. And I think Chloe, to me, is a touchstone because up until her and life is strange we really hadn't seen a lot of lgbtq leads in video games let alone ones that were kind of unanimously embraced and weren't sort of a, a whipping post for let's be honest some of the more unsavory people online even a lot of those people accepted her as a great character and i think little things like that just chip away at a lot of the prejudice and bigotry in our society, little by little, stuff like that changes people's opinions. I don't wanna oversell it, it is just a video game, but little stuff like that in pop culture, it does make a difference over time, and to me, she's one of the more iconic characters who kinda of carried that torch and changed perceptions for a lot of people who really enjoy video games. So to me, she is really important, and I think we need more characters like her in video games in general, and a lot of that comes down to how the character is drawn, how the character is voiced, the animations, all that stuff matters in how people are willing to accept or not accept video game characters. Um, and so to me, she was extremely important and, and I think probably to the LGBTQ community, also iconic. 
Um, so she's one. Another one I would say is Shepard from Mass Effect. And you may say, Shane, that doesn't make sense because you're Shepard. And that's exactly why <laughs> Shepard is really important. Because back when Mass Effect first launched, the majority of RPGs, you played as a character that the developers decided to create for you. And you were forced to play as that person. With the advent of Mass Effect and Shepard being able to basically step into the shoes as Shepard, as whether you want to play as a male or a female, whatever your alignment is, you can totally craft all of that in the Mass Effect franchise with Shepard. It's giving you agency over who the lead character is. And it had happened before Mass Effect, but Mass Effect was a franchise that hit critical mass, that made it okay for big budget high profile video games to let you become the character. And now, of course, almost every game gives you the option of creating your own character and essentially playing as yourself or having a fantasy and playing as someone else that you create. Um, I think we take that for granted now, but that was simply not the case when, Ma when Mass Effect first launched. So I think Shepard, AKA you, is an iconic character, but most importantly, it's important because it ended up influencing how RPGs are designed and how we played RPGs for the foreseeable future. So to me, Shepard from Mass Effect is a really, really important character inside gaming. And then I think my final pick would be, you know, and I could go the easy route. I could pick a character from Grand Theft Auto, or I could pick John from Red Dead Redemption. These are characters that led games that a lot of people played, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're important or iconic. So my last pick is Aloy. Um, Aloy from the Horizon franchise. Why is she important or iconic? Well, I would argue that the vast majority of female characters before Aloy, particularly for big budget, high profile games like Horizon Zero Dawn or Horizon Forbidden West, most of those female characters were memorable for what they weren't wearing, for, for their lack of clothes, for their huge heaving chests, their unrealistic proportions, I would argue. Aloy came along and was like, you know what? We can make a female character that isn't straight out of the pages of Playboy, and people will still be interested in playing with her or as her due to how we develop the character, the writing and things like that. It wasn't all about her appearance. Now, Aloy's not unattractive by any stretch of the imagination, but she's also a little bit mysterious. It's hard, it was really hard to tell through the first game, you know, whether she's straight or whether she's gay. And I like kind of tipped their hand a little bit more in Horizon Forbidden West in that vein, but there was mystery there. You didn't really know. And that didn't keep people from playing that game. That didn't turn people off. That's really great character development, particularly when you're dealing in a medium where there's a certain segment of the people who consume the medium who don't want those types of characters, yet they still loved Aloy. That is no small feat particularly coming from a developer like Guerrilla Games, where that wasn't really its forte before this. It was working on the Killzone first-person shooter games, where the story was really just kind of riding the sidecar. So Aloy, to me, is an achievement. Um, and again, I have to credit Sony's first-party studios and the people who run those studios um, for allowing something like this to happen. They could have very easily said, nope, no, we're not using Aloy as is. You need to go back, you need to pump up her boobs, I mean, you need to cut down on her covering. She needs outfits that are more revealing. It would have been easy to do that. And we did see some of the creepier parts of our game ship come out of the woodwork when Aloy was unveiled and people were going in and altering her face and saying, now that's how she should look. She should look pretty. So I'm attracted to her. It was a tough decision for Sony's first parties to make to make that call on Aloy. And I applaud them for doing that. Um, I will say this, it hasn't really paved the way for more realistic female characters in games. There are some. Um, obviously, if you play The Last of Us Part 2, there's kind of a similar thing going on there. One of the female leads in that is a little more masculine. In fact, she's way more ripped than I am, <laughs> I'll say that much. Um, but also there was a lot of upheaval over that character as well. So I wouldn't say that Aloy has kind of paved the way and made it smooth for these type of characters in the future, but it's a start and you always have to start somewhere. So look, I'm sure you guys have other picks for this. Feel free to leave them below in the comments. I'd love to hear your picks, but those are mine. All right, next up, we have a question from Neo JD. 
Why are preview events still a thing after COVID? Not in the everybody getting physically together aspect, but in the using money to fly people out to see a build of a video game aspect. Okay, this is kind of an inside baseball question, and as you know, on Ask Shane Anything, I have no problem answering those questions at all. Um, I do wonder how much most people care about what happens behind the scenes in the games industry, but I think most people who use Sifted do care, or you guys wouldn't be here. Because, let's be honest, if you're a sifter, you're the hardest of the hardcore. So, here we go. Um, let me explain where my confusion lies with this. Because all I keep hearing from various people, I'm not going to name names, is that, pe that these publishers don't want to do things like E3 because of the money. It's the money. It's the $5 million that they have to spend for a boost space. Or, let's be honest, less in most cases. Um, it's a money thing. There's not a return on investment. And as you guys know, I completely disagree with that. And I always will disagree with that. Um, and it's a little more curious when you start hearing about these preview and re review events that have kicked back up again. And for those of you who don't know, I've talked about this before, but you may have missed it. it. Back in the old days, like every game had a review event where they would send you, so they fly you somewhere. The really big games, they would send you like for Assassin's Creed. A lot of times they would ship journalists to the city where Assassin's Creed was set. And just and the crazy part about it is ultimately it's still just you sitting in a dark room with a TV screen playing the video game. Although, you know, if after that's over and you can go out into the city and get a feel and the vibe of the city, I can see where there's some value in that. Um, there was a couple Call of Duty review events. In fact, there was the one of the last big ones that they did. They there's a little airport nearby here, Santa Monica Airport. It's literally like planes fly over our building to land at that airport. I had to go there, and we got in this crazy military chopper, and they flew us all the way up the coast of California up to this area called Ojai, and there was a golf resort there where we stayed for like three or four days and just basically played the game. Like you played the single-player campaign in your hotel room, and then when it was time to play multiplayer, you went to a big community room at the resort where we all sat in a room and played the game together and played multiplayer. This stuff sounds a lot more glamorous than it really is. I know you hear this, and you're like, oh my gosh, that's payola. That will change your opinion on a game. No. <laughs> For years and years, we complained about this. We were like, man, like you're taking me away. And this was really bad during Q4. It's like, or you're taking me out of the office for four days to play Call of Duty when we have like 80 games releasing in the next like 25 days that I need to be on and making sure that my guys are on it and doing the work that's required to review all these games and preview all these games before the reviews and all that stuff. Most people did not enjoy going to these review events. I know that may be hard for you to understand. You're like, what do you mean, Shane? Go to some resort and like they put you up and you just play games. That sounds great on the surface if that's the only thing you have to do. It just made my life worse because now I'm like trying to play the campaign in between answering like 800 emails on my laptop. It was distracting versus being able to come home at night and just play the game on the couch. So we had asked for this forever. And sadly, it took something like a pandemic, COVID-19, for it to actually happen. And on, in honesty, I understand why you're confused because it did seem like that was one of the few positive side effects of COVID was that the games industry finally came to its senses and was like, you know what, we can just send you a download code and you can just play it at home at your leisure. That's the way you want to. You should want people reviewing games anyway. So I agree with you. I have been startled that the industry has just swung right back to, hey, we're going to fly a bunch of people out. For example, you may have seen they just did a Baldur's Gate 3 big preview event and everything. Game looks great, by the way. Really excited for it. But they flew people to Belgium. For that, they flew people all the way to Belgium to sit in an audience for 30 minutes. Why? Why would you do that? It's a huge waste of money. And so when I hear that these publishers are bailing on important events like E3 because of the money, I'm like, no, 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 no. They are reprioritizing how they're spending their money. And why, you may ask, do they want people there in person? Why are they willing to spend all that money to get someone to Belgium to see them in person versus just showing up at E3 and setting up a booth. It's because they feel like they can manipulate you. They feel like if you're there in person, they have at least a little bit of sway. I remember these review events. I went to hundreds of them. 
and you would play the game and then ultimately you'd have to go eat. <laughs> so you'd go to this place where they'd be there's be like a buffet or whatever. You get food, you sit down. 10 minutes after sitting down, somebody would saunter over to you. And I don't know if this happened to the smaller publications, but it definitely happened to me at the bigger publications. And they would saunter over and be like, so how's it going? Basically trying to get a read on whether you're liking the game or not. And if you're a seasoned journalist, you can pick up on this right away. Be like, well, you know, it's our editorial policy that we don't discuss things like this with PR. Now, I would discuss it with other journalists, and there is a possibility that someone could have went to some journalist from a smaller publication and asked them, and they told them, and they also said, and Shane Satterfield told me that he isn't really liking it, or he's loving it, or who knows. All I know is I can control what I can control, and I would not tell them. I'm like, you're going to have to wait and watch our review. And that's all I would say. And they knew after a while, like... Certain publishers wouldn't even bother me or approach me with that stuff anymore. But still, it would happen because they they want you to share your feedback. And if it's positive, they're going to be like, that's great, awesome, I agree, or whatever. If it's negative, they're going to try and shape your opinion or try to make up an excuse for why the game is doing something that you don't like. Or maybe there is a valid excuse for why the game is doing something the way it is. In that case, maybe it can be helpful. But the bottom line is they want to be near you so they can influence you. That's it. That's the only reason why they would do in-person events anymore versus just sending you a code and letting you cover it. And to be fair, for most people, you do just get a, get sent a code now and you just review the game at home. I have not gone to a review event in years. I haven't got an invite for a review event in years. And part of that is, you know, our audience isn't as big as game trailers was or whatever. Um, so anyway, that's what I think is going on. Again, I've been in this industry for a long time. I've been to hundreds and hundreds of these events throughout the years. Um, I know the PR people personally, and I think also too, once you get to know PR people, eventually they figure out you, you become more than just like work, whatever's like they know you and they will talk candidly with you eventually and you learn stuff. And so that's part of where I'm coming from on this response as well. So I agree with you. There is no reason whatsoever for them to be sending people anywhere to review or preview a game if they say something like well we want to be able to give you all the information then give us a a, a press release give us a fact sheet we can read like there's really no excuse for that to happen other than they want to have control over your opinion and try to shape it to what they want it to be <laughs> next up we have a question a short one from ott apps when will the beard return <laughs> okay that's a good one and I know where this is coming from because the graphics in the show, I have a beard. Um, so I totally understand why you would ask that. Also, when I came back after being gone for two years and said, hey, here's Sifted. This is what I'm doing. I had a beard. Um, but the reason that happened was um, after I left game trailers, I went and stayed with my dad for like three or four months. I hadn't really seen my dad much. We needed to reconnect our relationship. It kind of, I wouldn't say it was strained, but there just wasn't much of one there. Um, I was living in California. He was living all the way on the East Coast. He had two new kids with a new wife. Anyway, any, any of you know, who are the product of divorced parents know exactly what I'm talking about. So anyway, I was like, okay, I talked to Brent. Sifted is in motion. He needs to work on a bunch of stuff that I can't contribute too much to for the next couple months. So while he has his head down working on the site, he can still reach me, obviously. But while he's doing that, I'm going to go and do something that I need to do. And so I went and lived with my dad. My dad had COPD. Um, he was a coal miner and he had black lung basically. And, um, he could walk like 10 feet before he needed to stop and catch his breath. That's how bad his black lung was. So I knew my dad probably didn't have a ton of time left. And I knew that was the perfect opportunity to go and reconnect with him. So I went and lived with him basically for three or four months. And he had been working on a project car. Um, it was a roadster that was actually, I mean, it's, it's a roadster, but he had built it, really, it was his car. He created a car out of parts of other cars, basically. And he was struggling to get it done. His health was, was part of the issue. He had kind of run out of money for the project. And so I went and lived with my dad for like three months. I paid for all the stuff that he needed to finish the car. I paid for a couple laborers to come in and help, and I helped. Um, I also paid for my nephew, who was like 20 or whatever, to jump in and help. So it was my dad, Two of his friends that I was paying for, my nephew who I was paying for, and me. Basically, I was like, look, we're getting this car done. And that's what we did. We stayed there until, I stayed there until the car was done. But while I was doing that, I was like, you know what? I've never grown a beard. And 
why not do it now? Nobody can really see me. I'm off in the middle of nowhere. Nobody here knows who I am. If it looks awful, no one will know any different. And so I grew a beard for the first time ever. Um, and it, the one thing I'll say about growing a beard is there's this awkward, like, week and a half, two week period where it's, like, very itchy. Um, when you first start growing a beard, kind of like how I am right now, I just haven't shaved for a couple of days. It doesn't bother you. When it starts to get a little longer, it itches like crazy. And I don't really want to go through that again. Because <laughs> um, it is. You're just constantly, like, scratching your face and, like, doing this. It also becomes almost this, like, OCD, your beard does, um, where you're just constantly fiddling with it. And you always have to trim it. You always have to shave it down. I just... I mean, I'll be honest with you. I've a lot of people say I look good with a beard. I, I don't know if that's what you're insinuating. I don't know if you're saying I look terrible without one or whatever. But like most people, when I had a beard, when they did see it, were like, oh, you look good with a beard. Um, the maintenance of it was just eventually it just became too much of an annoyance. Um, and so I got rid of it. And I don't really have a desire for it to come back. Another part of it, too, is that like that was before like my beard turned gray. So I still had like a dark beard then. Now if I grew a beard, I'm sure you can see it. Like all everything here is like all gray. And everything here is like still colored. And it, I just think it would look crazy. So <laughs> um, I don't think I'll ever grow the beard back, unfortunately. Maybe maybe if the wife begs me to or something like that, I'll do it. But just for a bunch of different reasons, I, I'm, I'm good. I'm good on the beard. <laughs> all right, next up, we have a question from AJ, the legend. I'm wondering if you think we will see more Final Fantasy games similar to Final Fantasy 16, or do you think Square Enix will go back to the old style? Do you believe there is room to satisfy all fans of Final Fantasy? AJ, this question is very timely because I've been thinking about this big time, and I know it's pathetic and sad that I think about things like this when I'm like having free time, but it's just the way I am. So I have been thinking about this for a long time because, as you guys know, I love Final Fantasy 16. It's the first Final Fantasy I've really loved since, like, Final Fantasy 6. So um, I would say I have some... I have some skin in the game as far as whether this is the way Square Enix continues with the franchise or whether they go back to kind of the goofy, day-glow, androgyny style of Final Fantasy games, which I have never really resonated with and never really liked. Um, so what I would say was the first thing I looked at were sales. And $3 million in sales in the first week, that's not terrible. In fact, it's pretty damn good for a game that's exclusive to a platform that has like a $40 million install base. You're looking at like a 10% attach rate. That's actually pretty darn good. Like, even few games on Switch will ever hit that. Even Tears of the Kingdom, you know, 10% of attach rate means that it needs to sell like 16 million copies to hit 10%. That's a lot. So it's hard to hit that amount. And Final Fantasy 16 has already done that on PlayStation 5. So... 3 million may not seem like a lot, but in the context of it being a platform exclusive to one platform, that's actually pretty good. So that was pretty encouraging to me. Now, one thing you might remember is Square Enix expectations for sales are ridiculous and outrageous in a lot of cases. Um, the Tomb Raider games they used to publish, they would sell 8 million. They'd be like, oh, we expected 20 million. It's like, no, you probably shouldn't have expected that much. Square Enix has unrealistic expectations sometimes for its games. Now, we're already starting to hear that it's second guessing whether it should create DLC. Through the whole development of Final Fantasy 16, the developers were like, no, we're not gonna create DLC for this game at all. Now they're starting to change their tune. They're like, they're saying they're starting to think about DLC. Now they've also already said that they've just started work on the PC version, not the PlayStation 5 version's done. I'm also sure they're working on an Xbox Series X version of the game to be released eventually. There's all this work going on behind the scenes. So I and it is coming to new platforms. So I do hope that eventually it does hit that like 16 to 20 million mark because if it does, then I think we're good. And look, AJ, I don't know if you like Final Fantasy 16 or not. Maybe you do like the older style. I'm assuming that you at least enjoyed Final Fantasy 16. So um, then I think we're in business. Then I think we can count on more traditional fantasy versions of Final Fantasy going forward. But I, no matter how well it sells, I don't think it's for good. Um, just go back and look. I mean, you can see Final Fantasy IX was kind of a more, after Final Fantasy VII was a more traditional, and then they went back to more of the crazy style stuff for like 10, 10, 2, 12, more tradition. Square Enix goes back and forth, but it did seem like it was on quite a run there uh, of Final Fantasy games that I just wasn't interested in. So my guess is Square Enix is going to keep doing the same thing. Um, there is a possibility that the next Final Fantasy could be a direct sequel to 16. That's possible. And if that's the case, then obviously they're going to stick with the fantasy. But I think a lot of it will depend on when they finally do surveys of their fans. 
eventually Square Enix is going to reach out to fans and say, hey, what did you think about Final Fantasy 16? And I, I just have a feeling that whatever the results are of that outreach is going to determine at least the next couple entries. Although I would argue right now the next Final Fantasy is already in development. It's at least in the planning stages right now. So they need to do that research pretty quick. So if, they're, if Square Enix is smart, it will listen to fans because fans are what's most important. They're the evangelists who get other people excited about things and convince them to go buy stuff. So they do want to get the fans hooked in. But I also think that Square Enix should not be closed off to the idea of trying to create new fans for the franchise. Like, the franchise sells okay. It could sell a lot better. It's one of the biggest franchises in the industry. And I do feel like the look and the style of the last few Final Fantasy games could have turned off a pretty big portion of game players. So I do think a fantasy setting has a wider appeal than what they're doing otherwise with the Final Fantasy games. I do realize some fans of the franchise think that's sacrilege. I totally get that, and I totally respect it. Um, to answer your question of what's going to happen, I just think they're going to continue on as they have been. It's going to be a hodgepodge of different styles of games, different settings, different lead protagonists, things like that. Um, but I do hope that they take at least a few cues from Final Fantasy 16 going forward. How they integrated the summons, the icons into Final Fantasy 16, to me, that's the way they should be handled from here on out. Turn-based combat versus action-based combat. In my opinion, the game should be an action RPG going forward. I do know this is a sticking point for a lot of you. Some of you feel like Final Fantasy should always be a turn-based RPG. Again, I respect your opinion. I don't agree with it, but I respect it. But to me, a more action-based combat system, that's where RPGs are going. Turn-based RPGs are yesterday's news in a lot of ways. Uh, so if you want your brand to be perceived as on the bleeding edge, I think it needs to have action-based combat, and I think they're on a great path with the franchise so far. So I'm kind of answering your question, and I'm answering it by saying that like, I don't think either style is going to be the style going forward. <laughs> Next up, our last question comes from Ben. Do you think gaming addiction is being sufficiently discussed in modern discourse? I really struggle to distangle whether my position on this is internalized game cynicism from my parents or something genuine. I do feel the claws of addiction around gaming, but I don't think I'd be classified as an addict. I have a job. I have a wife. My broader relationships aren't suffering much. <laughs> That's funny. But I feel that compulsion to game all the time. As soon as I get a free second, the PC is on. Okay, so I have talked about gaming addiction before, and a lot of people disagree with me on it, <laughs> because I have admitted, that's the right word to use, I think, that there have been times where I feel like I might have a gaming addiction. Um, and generally, those moments pop up when I'm playing whatever my daily driver is. So I've, I talk all the time about these games that I that are in my life that when I'm, I have 20 minutes here or 30 minutes there, I'm waiting for the wife to get ready to go to dinner, I'll just plop down on the couch and I'll spend 20 minutes with them. Like those games are like Call of Duty multiplayer, Rocket League, stuff like that. Um, I do feel sometimes when I'm playing those games, when I'm playing my 2000th game of Rocket League or... I look at um, how many kills and deaths I have in the latest Call of Duty, or I look at my level in the latest Call of Duty, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like level 175. Like, that. that's when I start thinking to myself, am I playing these games because it's the best thing I could be doing with my time and I enjoy it that much, or am I playing those games to fill the time and fill a void? It's a fine line to walk, I'll be honest with you. I, I guess the way I always come down on it is do I feel like I need to play it or do I want to play it and that is kind of the line that's drawn between something you really enjoy doing and being addicted to something I don't for example if I don't play those games that I just mentioned I don't feel like there's something missing or there's a void like I don't feel before I lay my head down on the pillow at night that I haven't hit my quota of any game for the day or I missed out on something even with the way game passes work and how there's content that comes in and it's only there for a couple days and then it's gone like I don't have FOMO for that stuff so I don't think I'm addicted to games I do feel like it's become a pattern in my life and sometimes it's like okay work day is done don't need to play any games for game face sit down oh I guess I'll just play Rocket League oh I guess I'll just play a couple rounds of Call of Duty it's become this 
crutch. And there are times when I do that and I get to like my second round of multiplayer and I'm like, wait a minute, I have other stuff that I could be doing that I should probably be doing. Like I've been trying to get rid of a lot of my house record collection, but I can't do it until I listen to every record and find tracks on records that I want to keep and then I need to digitize. It's this very long convoluted process. And I do think that sometimes I play games to avoid doing something I don't want to do, like digitizing my vinyl so that I can get rid of a lot of it. So is that an addiction? I don't think it is. I think some ways it's procrastination. It's me replacing something I don't really want to do with something I kind of want to do. But again, it's a fine line. Um, you're saying um, that you every free second you get, you turn your PC on. I mean, a lot of that is context sensitive. It's like, are you playing a game that you had to stop because of life at a very important moment. If that's the case, that's gonna stay in the back of your mind until you have a free minute to go and play that. And so it's hard for me based upon just your question to tell you whether you actually have gaming addiction. Although I can say this, just from the verbiage of your question, you're at least on it, you're paying attention. I would argue that if you're doing that, you're already ahead of the game. Most people who are addicts have no idea they're addicts or they just completely are in denial and don't want to admit it. The fact that you're looking at your life critically and how you're spending your time, that to me are already shows me that you're not an addict. You are just someone who really enjoys playing video games and that's okay. If you look at your day and you're like, I could do this, this or this, or I could play video games. None of this stuff that I have on the table are things that need to be done. It's just stuff that I could do. And you choose video games. That's a hundred percent fine. That's why you're here. That's why you're a sifter. So even though I have said to myself, several times, maybe I'm a gaming addict. I really don't think that I am. Um, I also don't, like if my wife comes to me and is like, we need to go do this. Like, I don't say like, just one more round or like, just hold on a second. Like I turn it off and I get up and we go. And I think when you start crossing those lines, when you're sacrificing things that you need to do um, to be a responsible adult, that's when people might be able to say that you have a gaming addiction or at least an unhealthy obsession. So if you're just out there playing a ton of games because it's what you really love to do and it's not sacrificing other parts of your life, which it sounds like it's not for you, Ben, then I think you're A-OK. -okay. All right, that's it for Ask Shane Anything. I hope you guys have a great weekend plan. And if you want to play games, it's totally OK. You don't have to go out and do something else. If you'd prefer to play games with this weekend, that is fine. Obviously, you guys are probably trying to finish up Final Fantasy 16, maybe Diablo 4, maybe Tears of the Kingdom, gigantic games that take like a month to complete. If you're trying to finish those, I wish you all good luck. Um, as I always say, thanks to everybody who pledges at the $7 or more tier. That is why this show happens. That is how this show happens. Um, so I appreciate you guys very much, but I also appreciate all our patrons because without you guys, none of this would happen. So thanks to all you guys who support us in any way, shape or form. Head on over and subscribe with Twitch Prime right now. That would be awesome. I'd appreciate that. Hope you guys have a great weekend. I'll see you next Friday.